Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Today's video, I'm going to do a straight up no BS OBS shootout. These are both referred to as old body style. You got an OBS Ford and an OBS Chevy 7.3 Power Stroke versus 6.5 Turbo Diesel. You guys know that I've been on the channel, and to the newcomers, welcome. This is my truck. I affectionately call it the Wood Weasel. This is my getting in, hauling firewood. I haul water, I tow trailers. This is my yard work truck. This is not my daily driver, but it's been a great truck. I've put a decent amount of kilometers on it since I've had it. And I'm gonna go into the ins and outs of these. Maybe you're looking for a towing, pulling, driving diesel truck, but you don't wanna spend 50 grand. Well, there's still tons of these left on the market. I did a search in places in the States and in Canada. There are still tons of these for sale. And they're available and they're not going to cost you an arm and a leg, but they're not cheap anymore. That's one thing I will say. The days of cheap old school diesels are long gone. My new truck here is a 96 F250 XLT trim Power Stroke 7.3 with a 5-speed ZF5 transmission. My old truck is a 6.5 1996 K2500 6.5 turbo diesel. This has the 4L80E transmission in it. So these trucks are apples to apples, but they couldn't be more different in how they function and run. I'm gonna get into that. Maybe you're looking for one of these and you're not sure. Well, I'm gonna really give you guys the ins and outs. I am not a brand loyal guy, but I have been a Chevy driver. This is my fifth Chevy truck. So I've had a lot of Chevy. Chevy tends to be my bread and butter, but I thought this time, let's try a totally different truck. And I'll discuss why I went after the F-250 7.3 Power Stroke. Anyhow, 96 Ford versus 96 Chevy. Let's get right into it. Let's have a look under the hoods and talk about the power specs on both of these trucks. Let's talk about these motors and I'm gonna compare them because really that's the heart of these trucks is the engine. Let's have a look under the hood at each one. Okay, let's have a look at under the hood of the K2500. 6.5 liter Detroit diesel engine, 395 cubic inches, indirect injected. Uh, this is a turbo motor. Let's have a listen to how this thing sounds. Let's have a look at the good old 7.3 Power Stroke. This motor is completely stock. There's nothing done to it. It's like a time capsule under the hood. 444 cubic inches. So it's substantially larger than the 6.5. Might be an apples to oranges comparison, but that GM truck directly competed with this Ford truck in 96. So they are apples to apples. This is an international motor, uh, 444E is what they're called when they're in an international heavy truck. Let's fire this thing up and have a listen to it. cheat sheet here let's talk about both these motors uh this is a shootout so we're going to give one point to the motor that i like the best they both sound incredible 
Uh, that was a no glow plug start with both of these. I pretty much just fired them both up. They both start easily. Um, this truck starts incredible in the winter. I haven't had this one in the winter yet, but let's talk about sound. This has a unique clackety clack indirect injection sound. It sounds vintage. This motor has a nice sound. It sounds good when you're going down the highway. This thing sounds like a semi, like a rig when you fire it up. It sounds more powerful. It's got more of an industrial type engine sound to it. Um, but again, it's apples to oranges. They both sound great. I like driving both of them. They both have a nice diesel sound to them. Okay, so let's talk about the power output because really you're buying these for the motor. You want a diesel engine because you want the benefits of a diesel motor. I got a cheat sheet here because I didn't want to misconstrue any of the facts on these. So this motor here, this is an L65 code. Um, the VIN number, if you check the 8th VIN on these trucks, it'll tell you which motor you have. The 8th VIN is the motor. This is an L65 motor. I believe it's an F code. Um, this is one of the higher, they call this an high output 6.5 if there is such a thing. This motor is 190 horsepower at 3400 RPM and about 380, 385 foot-pounds of torque at, let's see, what do we got here? 1700 RPM. So there is a huge spread between the max torque and the max horsepower curve in this motor. You can find the horsepower specs on your air cleaner housing on these trucks. So that's where I showed you guys the horsepower specs. That's where they are located on these trucks. Now this motor here, it is approximately or exactly 50 cubic inches bigger. These are both V8, so they are apples to apples. We all know the Cummins is a good motor. Um, that was high up on my list, but I ended up finding this power stroke. But yeah, the straight six Cummins is a good motor too. But for this shootout, we're only gonna go after these two trucks. This truck here makes 215 horsepower at 3000 RPM. So this truck, has 35 more horsepower and it makes 450 foot pounds of torque at 2000 RPM. So it makes its horsepower lower and it makes its torque a little bit higher. So there's less of a spread between your max torque and your max horsepower in this motor. Also, that's a lot of power difference. This has 70 foot pounds of torque more than this truck does and it makes it at a little bit higher of an RPM. So. These two motors, they're both great. Let's talk about fuel mileage. I've driven this truck, I've towed with it. I am averaging between 18 and 20 miles per gallon with this truck. This truck has 355 axles and a five speed manual. Okay, my last tank, I got 19 and a half liters per hundred, or sorry, 19 and a half miles per gallon, which is about 12 and a half liters per hundred. That's incredible when you consider the weight of this truck. Now that was towing and straight driving. This truck, I average about 18 miles per gallon. This truck is better on fuel if I'm just straight driving it. I've gotten up to 22, 23, 24 miles per gallon with this truck. Towing, this thing drinks a little bit more because it doesn't have the sheer grunt of this motor, okay? So if you're just gonna be towing and you're looking for a towing rig, I would pick this motor all the way. If you want straight fuel mileage, I would pick this motor. But because these are heavy duty work trucks, I'm gonna give the first thumbs up of the day to the 7.3 Power Stroke. It's a better motor all in all. It's just, it's got more power. It can be lugged. I can pull this thing out of a corner with a trailer behind it at 750 RPM, give it throttle and it'll pull out of the hole, no problem and get straight up to 2,000, 2,500 RPM and I can pull another gear. This motor, because it's an automatic, I can't do that, but this motor doesn't make the power down low that this motor does. So again, fuel mileage, power, torque, pulling ability, I'm giving the first thumbs up to the 7.3 Power Stroke. Now, let's talk about how much these weigh, payloads, stuff like that in the next part of this series. Let's talk about the actual chassis, the, the similarities and the differences between them. Is there any similarities? Let's find out. Okay, now let's talk about the chassis of these trucks. And again, I live in the Rust Belt. That's what a frame looks like up here. It's fine. This frame's in great shape. It's got a little bit of rust on one of the sh uh, shackle hangers on the back, but whatever. 
I see you can buy shackle kits, so I'll just replace them. This has the uh, fifth wheel mounts. It's also got a gooseneck in it right now. Uh, I put a 16,000 pound class five Kurt hitch on it. I wanted more hitch than I'd ever need. Uh, I hate guessing and worrying about stuff um, when I'm towing. Okay, so this truck has a massive 10 and a half or 10 and a quarter inch Sterling um, full floating rear axle, tough as nails. This truck has three leafs and a giant overload on the bottom. Okay, uh, clearance, there's probably six to seven inches of suspension movement before you're on the overloaders, okay? So rear end, this truck is stout. Um, I see no problems with me doing the abusive things that I do to my trucks with this truck. Let's go look at the GM. Okay, here's the Chevy. You guys have seen this rear diff before. I've been into it, I've split it, I've, you know, I pulled the axles out when we first got the truck and did brakes. This is what's called the 14 bolt corporate axle. This is a 10 and a half inch axle, so it is slightly bigger uh, than the Ford. Which one's stronger? I don't know. I think they're both equally strong. I have no concerns about either of these axles breaking. They both have a 6,000 plus, uh, pound plus weight rating. And so honestly, I'm gonna say there's no plus or minus. My GM has four Leafs and uh, an overloader. I have pushed the GVW limit to the of this truck many times. Now you guys notice I have, you guys look here. Oh, what's that? Hold on. See, we don't want that rubbing, do we? I wonder how long that's been there. I have uh, Airlift 5000 series airbags and a compressor on this thing. Um, those will be going on. I'm going to put another kit on my new F250 because I can't live life without these. If you have a work truck, a hauling truck, a towing truck, and you push the limits, you should get a set of these. They smooth out the ride. You don't beat the tar out of your suspension. And if you're a little heavy, you can pump it up and still have factory rake. Meaning you don't beat the tar out of your front suspension when you're towing because your tires are still making full contact. So anyhow, enough about that. Okay, let's talk about payloads on both of these. Hey, Daisy, let's talk about them payloads. <laughs> Daisy is pretty much always part of the payload on this truck. She sits in that passenger seat proud as a peacock. Okay, payloads on both of these trucks are very similar. They're both three quarter tons. Um, this truck, this series of truck has a higher payload than this series of truck. Now, I was shocked to find that out. And I'm going to tell you why I think that is. I'm 98% sure. But this truck... If you read the factory specs and, you know, cross that with what you read on the internet, average payload spec for this truck is 3,700 pounds. Now, if you look at the weight rating of this axle and that axle, these both have a payload rating or a weight rating on the rear axle of north of 6,000 pounds. So these axles are strong. This one's 3,700 pounds. This one's somewhere around 35 is what I'm reading. Now, the reason why is, from what I think, now, payloads are a funny thing because you have to take away you as the driver and anything else you have in the truck. These trucks factory came with 235-85-16s. These tires will not take the weight, okay? And that's easy enough to spot because if you look at this truck, 2,773 pounds, okay, and that is dual, 3,000 pounds single load, okay, so if you're looking at your, at how much weight your tire can take, it's 3,042 pounds at 80 PSI. Let's look at the Chevy. Yes, Daisy, Daisy's helping out with the video. <laughs> this truck has 265, 75 R16s, again, 10 ply, 3,415 pounds at 80, okay? So this truck, these tires are capable of carrying 800 pounds more between both of them, okay? These are stock size tires on this truck. These are stock size tires on this truck. 
if you put these tires on this truck, you could add about 400 pounds roughly to this thing's carrying capability. Okay, so having bigger or more tire on your towing rig is a better deal. Okay, so payload rating, you guys have seen me put 4,000 pounds in the back of this truck. I've done it many times. In fact, I've been doing it since I've owned this truck. With or without the bags, this truck does it. Without the bags, it is sacked out, but I haven't broken anything, knock on wood. And that, that weight is predominantly carried on gravel roads. I am sure that this truck will take the weight and maybe some more. Um, these are heavy trucks. Okay, so payload, I'm gonna say it's a tie. These things will both take a lot of weight, but that gets us to our next part. Okay, so let's talk about why I picked the Ford. This truck has a Dana 55 front diff, nice and heavy, but it is independent front suspension. This has radius arms and leaf springs. Now this is not an ideal setup, but it is substantially heavier than what you find on the GM. Here's your GM. This has independent front suspension. It has an eight and a quarter inch GM front diff. It has CV joints, upper and lower control arms, and these have the famous loved or hated um, GM torsion bar front suspension. Um, they're okay. Let's talk about the pluses and minuses of both of these front ends. Okay, so this is all tied into ride quality, drivability of these two trucks. This truck here has independent front suspension. This truck has independent front suspension, but it has leaf springs and those radius arms or whatever you want to call them. I'm not sure exactly what Ford calls them. This truck has torsion bars. If you're looking for a super smooth ride in a three quarter ton, just pick this. This truck rides way nicer than this truck, way nicer. So if you're looking for ride quality, this is your truck. But let's face it, these are not half tons. These are not for going to Costco to get groceries. These are for doing work. At least they are in my world. I know, uh, I know there's a lot of fellas that drive around in big trucks and they don't really tow or haul anything. But in my world, these are tools for doing work. So my biggest problem is I love that GM nice ride, but here's the problem. These things eat front suspension parts, upper and lower ball joints constantly. Um, Pitman arms, idler arms, inner and outer tie rod ends. You're constantly doing front end parts on these trucks. These things ride like a shopping cart, but they're going to last longer, okay? It, the suspension components are just heavier. So, again, I give the thumbs up. Now, if you don't want this independent front end, you want a straight front axle, get an F350. But on the F250s, that's what they have. So, suspension, I'm going to give the thumbs up for this. It rides like a tractor, but it's going to last longer. This thing's constantly going through front end parts. Way nicer to drive, but that's not what this truck's for. It's for doing work. Okay, let's jump right into interiors. Here's the GM. This truck has 370, 380,000 kilometers, original interior. It's worn, but it's not ripped. GMs generally have good quality interiors. Uh, power windows, door locks, the window switches are broken. This truck eats door handles. It's dirty and dusty in here. I'm gonna say interior quality. I give the GM a thumbs up. Um, it's well insulated. It's quiet in the cab when you're driving on the highway. There is a lot of wind noise in this truck, but I got that cool Lund visor. Um, I think that's where a lot of the wind noise comes from, but um, comfy seats and really just a nice truck to spend a day in. It's modern enough that it's got all the creature comforts, but it's old school enough that it's kind of neat. Let's have a look at the Ford. Okay, here's the interior in the F-250. Again, no rips in the seats. These Fords are renowned for rip seats. This one's minty. This truck was very well looked after. This interior is 95% original and perfect. It's got the high idle controller. Um, you can adjust the RPM up and down. Typical Ford, very plain Jane, very utilitarian. Uh, my pops always drove Ford trucks, so uh, I'm very used to this interior. He had a, I believe it was a 96 F-150 for years, and I 
I'm pretty sure it had this exact same interior in it, so very familiar to me. Now, I will say, friends, I'm given the interior uh, comfort and, and just how nice it is to spend a day in to the Chevrolet. Interior comfort, sound deadening, and just quality I'm going to give to the Chevrolet. I think these had better quality interior components, and they're just plain quieter. They're nicer to spend a day in. 25-year-old me probably would have really appreciated the engine noise of this truck, but 41-year-old me says, hey, I'd like a little less noise. So definitely one thumb up for the uh, GM on the interior. Hey, let's do the wrap-up. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Maybe you're looking at one of these trucks or both of them. You know, maybe you're looking at a Cummins also. Now, friends, here locally, I stay away from the Cummins. I love the motor, don't like the truck. Uh, the Cummins extended cabs have those little flip down seats in this era. A lot of them do. Um, the bodies just rot on them. The frames rot. There's not a lot of those left here. I saw a couple for sale. They were thousands of dollars more than this and they were rotten. So I said, okay, no Cummins for this guy. I love a Cummins though. Great motor. But if you're looking at either of these and wondering which one should I buy, again, Light duty engine, it's not going to last the miles. That's a fact. Um, these these are rated to last, I think, 300,000 miles, somewhere around there. Um, I could be off on that. That's one thing I didn't research. Um, but 300, 350,000 miles is probably about the average of how long these motors last. And that's with good maintenance. And I mean sound. You're changing your air filter all the time, your fuel filter, and your oil filter, and your oil all the time can't be skipping that stuff with these this is a medium duty engine these are rated at i believe the service life on this engine is about 500,000 miles a lot of them go longer some of them go not as long but i'd say the average is 500,000 uh i've met people that have that on their power strokes these are one owner trucks that were maintained and their trucks were still towing and hauling so um this is going to last you longer this is going to have a cheaper buy-in. Let's talk about costs on both of these before we wrap it up. These trucks are going up in value. They're getting more and more expensive. Um, your buy-in to get an F-250 7.3 Power Stroke, especially a 5-speed. There's one 5-speed here for every 10 automatics. Um, your buy-in on these is going to be substantially more. Even a beat-up you know, truck that's got dents and dings and rust and high miles here like this is going to be a $5,000 truck. On the opposite end, a truck like this, one owner, clean, low mile, mint interior, nothing done to it, no rust. I've seen those go for twenty to $30,000. So, and then every price in between. The most valuable seems to be the crew cab. The crew cab F350 is the one that everybody's looking for, including me. The problem was I couldn't find one either at a price point that I was willing to pay or at a price point that I was willing to take the risk because a lot of them are lifted with wheels and stacks coming up the back and I just I wasn't sure there's nothing wrong with that stuff but if if you chip and pipe and tune your truck and you you don't know what you're looking for you can do a lot of damage in a hurry so uh, I bought this truck for what I think is a good price some people would probably say I overpaid for it maybe I did but uh this is a truck I was comfy with. I've driven it enough now that this truck, I trust it. It seems to be very reliable. It just purrs down the highway. These trucks here locally, uh, you know, a sitting needs a bunch of work, but still good running truck. You can get these for two grand. It's hard to argue with it. That's a lot of truck for two grand. Um, a truck that's on the road, plated, driving, uh, five to $8,000. A clean one I'm seeing for 10 to 12. 10 to 12 seems to be the max limit here. You can get these with the NV 4500 five speed. Those are not without their issues. Uh, Dodge had the same transmission and the same problems. There really doesn't seem to be many or any of those left here. They all seem to be automatic. So, but, uh, so the buy-in of these is way cheaper. Maintenance costs are way cheaper on this truck than they are on this truck. Um, when you do need to do major servicing, up lift pumps and injectors, stuff like that, um, maintenance costs are going to be higher on this truck and way lower on this truck. So what does that bring me to? Well, let's talk about the winner. These are both great trucks. If you want your first diesel, you're not afraid to wrench, um, and you want your first diesel truck, you don't have a huge budget, these are great trucks. 
Now, if you're a guy like me, this was my first diesel truck, friends. Um, this is my second diesel truck. I wanted more capability, more pulling power, good fuel economy, and just a bigger, tougher truck. That's why I went with this. So for me, this truck is hands down the winner. This is substantially more truck than this Chevy. I'm sorry, Chevy guys. I've been a Chevy guy my whole life. This truck is not in the same league as this. And I say that kind of with a tear in my eye. I built this truck. This truck ran, but did not drive when I got it. I've been into every part of this truck from one end to the other and made it into the truck that it is. But this truck is just not this. Um, for driving around, this is a great truck. It's quiet, it's smooth, it takes the bumps well. But for doing work, which let's face it, these are work trucks, friends. They're not, you might as well get a half ton if you're not gonna work these things. A half ton's cheaper to own, cheaper to buy, smoother, quieter, faster when you're passing cars down the highway. I mean, it's really hard to argue with a half ton, but if you're doing work, this one is the hands down winner. So Chevy guys, don't hate me. I still drive a Chevy every day. My work truck is a Chevy Silverado 1500. It's a great truck. Um, but in this era, in the 90s, the turbo diesel realm, uh, this truck wins hands down. Anyhow, friends, I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you have any questions about either of these, my opinion, um, I'm trying to be super uh, non-partisan in these two trucks. I really, I took a week, I drove this truck every day and really thought about it. I bought this truck mainly, friends, because it's a five-speed and it has an extended cab and it has more power. I didn't buy it because I had to have a, an OBS Ford. It's just what I found locally and I thought it was going to be a good truck for my needs. Now that I own it, I totally understand why these trucks are what they are and why people value them. But moving on, friends, uh, post a comment below. What do you drive? Do you drive a diesel truck? What do you pull with? Um, how many miles on it? Also, have you owned both of these? Do you agree with what I'm saying or do you disagree? Post a comment below. Uh, thumbs up or thumbs down. You guys know the deal. Anyhow, I'm going to get inside where it's cool. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for watching. Take her easy. Later. How's it going, everybody? Hope you guys enjoyed that truck comparison. Just having fun horsing around in the yard with two pick em up trucks that I own and love. Anyhow, time for question of the day. Today's question of the day comes from Jerry. Jerry is from Amsterdam, Holland. That's pretty cool. How's it going, buddy? Jerry did something that I've done before. I've had this problem. Uh, Sounds like he didn't have a splitter, so he used a heat gun and separated the crank case. And now he has a problem with the bearings are stuck on the crankshaft. It's a still 034 Super. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. Also, he has some corrosion in the cases. Well, I'll post the pictures that he sent, and then I'll give the answer to the question. Okay, as you can see, the bearings are stuck on there. So there's two ways to remove them. First way is the easy way. Uh, get a bearing separator. It's two plates uh, with a circle in it, and it's kind of knife-edged. And what it does is it has two bolts on it, and you clamp it underneath the bearing. And then it has two holes that you screw bolts into, and you it'll squeeze underneath the bearing, and you pull the bearings off. That's way number one if you have a bearing separator. I have a couple of them. They work good, but sometimes they don't quite fit on chainsaw cranks. And you end up having to use number two. Number two is not for the faint of heart. Take a Dremel or a cutoff wheel and cut the outer bearing off. Take that off. Now you will have the inner race that is stuck on there. That's the part that's actually gripping the crankshaft. Take that and score it with your with your cutoff wheel not all the way through though because you don't want to cut the crank once it's scored take a hammer and a chisel and put the chisel on the score mark and just give it a little tap and usually you'll shatter that race and it'll come right off um the other way you can do it is get a heat gun heat the bearing up put the bearing in a bench vise heat up the bearing and then take a mallet and slightly gently tap 
the end of the crank with a hammer. I don't like that method as much because sometimes you can you can wound the crank pretty bad, but that also works. Also, the the corrosion in the crankcase. First thing, make sure none of the paint is coming off in the crankcase. If it is, take a sanding drum or a Dremel or a wire brush and get rid of all that paint that's that's flaking off. Get rid of all the paint. Because what will happen is it'll let go and it'll go through the motor and you'll end up blowing the motor up. I've done that before on the channel. Uh, 038 Magnum did that. The little bit of corrosion in the bearing pocket. Take a wire wheel, something, uh, a brass wire wheel and just go in there and buff it out and you should be good to go. Clean it up good and put your new bearings in and you should be good to go. Anyhow, hope that helps you out. Thanks for sending questions of the day, and to everybody else, keep sending your questions of the day, and thanks for watching. Take her easy. Later.